Welcome to video 2 for week 5. In the previous video I introduced vector fields. And I want to introduce an interesting concept today to understand sort of how vector fields operate, relying again on the two basic interpretations that I'm going to use throughout the course of vector fields describing fluid flow, ocean currents, wind speeds, and fields of force, electromagnetic and gravitational force in particular. So I want to think what happens if I say have a buoyant object in my fluid. So the fluid is flowing and at each point in space there's some direction that tells me locally at that point in space how the fluid is flowing. If I s drop a buoyant object in my fluid it's going to move with re in response to the fluid. So there's going to be some path that it takes that follows somehow the vectors of the vector field. Similarly if I put a massive object in a field of gravitational force, or a charged object in a field of electromagnetic force. Those forces are going to act on those objects and cause some acceleration, so the object's going to move. Where is it going to move? What path is it going to take? Both of these questions, what happens to objects in these fields, are answered by paths, and paths are parametric curves. So when I have a vector field, I should be able to ask what are the parametric curves associated to that vector field that describe the paths that objects will take? Now I should be careful, this should be objects that start at rest. If objects have some initial velocity, then their paths are going to be different depending on the interaction of their initial velocity and the effects of the vector field. But if an object starts at rest, where will it go? What will happen to it? These paths are going to be called integral curves. Paths are described by parametric curves, so now I have a relationship between a vector field and a parametric curve, and let me understand what that relationship is. If I have the arrows of the vector field, then the parametric curve, starting here, it's going to go in this direction here. When it gets over here, it's going to go in this direction. When it gets over here in this direction, I'm going to have a parametric curve that matches those arrows. That means that the tangents to the parametric curve have to be the same as the arrows of the vector field. So a parametric curve is an integral curve for a vector field if its tangents are the same as the vector field evaluated at that point on the integral curve. So this is a bit of a strange formula, but this really is the formula that captures that idea that the tangent to the parametric curve and the vector, which is the vector field, at that point, the point is gamma of t, so the tangent and the point gamma of t, the field evaluated at that point, have to be the same thing. I'll talk more about this equation later in the video when we talk about trying to solve for integral curves, which is quite a hard problem, but let me give some more illustrations. So here's a vector field in R2. f of x, y is the vector negative y, x. Uh, this gives us something that looks like it should be counterclockwise rotation. What are the integral curves? Indeed, the integral curves are exactly circles going counterclockwise. So at each point on the circle, the tangent to the circle is the same as the vector field. And these tangents are larger the further I go out and smaller the further I go in. And that makes sense. If I'm going around the circles at the same rate, uh, then the tangents are going to be longer vectors further out and smaller vectors further in. All right, that's visually what's going on. We can fairly easily see that these curves fit these directions. What's going on algebraically? So the parametric curve that describes a counterclockwise circle is gamma of t is a cos t, a sine t, where a is the radius, and these all take exactly the same amount of time to go around t from 0 to 2 pi. So let me take the derivative of this. So the derivative of cos is negative sine, derivative of sine is cos. So these are my tangents to my parametric curve. Now let me evaluate the, the vector field on the parametric curve. So how do I do that? Well, the vector field is negative y and x. So I'm going to take the y component of the parametric curve, multiply it by negative 1, write it here. I'm going to take the x component of the parametric curve, write it here. So that's what it means to compose a vector field on a parametric curve. It means taking the components of the parametric curve, x, y, if I had another one, z, and replacing those components with the variables x, y, z in the expression for the vector fields. And if I do that, I get exactly the same thing as gamma prime. 
These will both be equations of t whenever I do this calculation. These are both going to be vectors that depend on t, and they have to be the same in each component for this to be an integral curve. Here's another example. f of xy is just xy. These are outgoing uh, vectors that get larger the further away I am from the origin. The integral curves are going to be rays going outwards, starting the origin. I'm going to have integral curves that go outwards, and then these have to accelerate as I go further out. So they have small tangents here, and they have larger tangents out here. So I need movement along rays out from the origin that accelerates. The solution here is, in fact, exponential acceleration. So if I take the parametric curve, uh, gamma of t equals a e to the t, b e to the t. This is going to be a parametric, parametric curve that has slope determined by the numbers a and b, much like the radius was determined by a in the previous example. The derivatives, these are exponential functions. The constant stays the constant, so these derivatives are the same. And then if I evaluate on the vector field on the parametric curve, well, I just take the x component, put it in the x. I take the y component, put it in the y. So this stays there this stays there, I get exactly the same thing. So the derivative of the parametric curve and the vector field evaluated on the parametric curve are exactly the same thing. The fact that I had an unknown radius in the previous example and an unknown a and b in this example, that makes sense because I'm essentially doing differential equations and differential equations depend on initial conditions. I have all these different parametric curves and they depend on where I start. If I start here, I'm going to be on that curve. If I start here, I'm going to be on that curve. If I start here, I'm going to be on that curve. And each of these starting points is a location A and B, a point in R2. That determines these constants. So these constants are reasonable. I do expect a family of, of integral curves. I get infinitely many integral curves for possible choices of starting points. And that makes sense because a curve doesn't fill all the space. To get integral curves that match a whole vector field over a region in space, I'm going to need an infinite family of integral curves. Often we'll talk about the family of integral curves as opposed to an individual one. And if we have a nice expression, we can often set it up so this can be thought of as the whole family as the numbers a and b vary. All right, let me talk about this equation that describes parametric curves, that describes integral curves. It says that the derivative of the parametric curve is the same as the vector field at that point. So if I write this in components, say I'm working in R3, well, I can write this as components 1, 2, and 3 for the parametric curve, and components 1, 2, and 3 for the vector field, F1, F2, and F3. These still depend, in general, on all three components because the first component of the vector field can have x's, y's, and z's in it. It's just the first part of that, the first component. So what I get here is actually a system of differential equations. This is a single variable function. This is a single variable function. This is a single variable function. And I get that all three of these single variable functions can depend on their derivatives can depend on the original single variable functions in some complicated way. I get a system of differential equations. And this is sort of terrifying because solving systems of differential equations is a pretty difficult thing. Even when f is linear, which is the nicest case, which if you've taken differential equations, we talked a little bit about linear systems. There are some techniques there, but even that gets quite difficult, let alone when f is a nonlinear function. And this gets prohibitively difficult. That said, let me talk about some examples where it's possible. I'm not going to give a lot of general techniques for finding integral curves. As I said, this is a really hard problem. But I'm going to give a couple examples to show that there are special situations where this does work. So you shouldn't think of this as a, as a way of always solving. You should think of this as very, very special, very particular examples that are set up nicely to make good solutions. So if I have the vector field that is just uh, x, y, z, at each point I get the vector that is the vector of that point as a local direction vector, of course. Then the system of differential equations here, well, x is only going to depend on x, y is only going to depend on y, z is only going to depend on z. So the derivative of this is just the original function, the derivative of this is the original function, the derivative of this is the original function. These are the classic exponential differential equations. The exponential function is the only function which is its own derivative. So to solve them, I just write exponential functions. I get constants of integration in the solutions of these. You could do them as separable differential equations if you wanted. 
and the constants would show up in front of the exponential function. And as before, these depend on the initial conditions. Here I have three of them, which makes sense because I'm working in R3. So I will have three different degrees of freedom in choosing my initial conditions. Uh, here's a, another one. This one has a little bit more interaction, so I don't get three entirely independent equations. But this shows you that, again, under certain special circumstances, I can actually solve for the integral curves. So if I look at the first differential equation, the first differential equation, I have a constant in the first component. So that's quite nice. This says that gamma 1 prime of t is a constant. Well, then to get gamma 1, I can just integrate this constant. And if I integrate a constant dt, I get t plus some unknown constant of integration a. Then the y component is 2 times the x function. So that says that gamma 2 prime is 2 times gamma 1. Well, I already know gamma 1. So since this is sort of set up that each one depends on the previous, I can actually do this iteratively. So then gamma 2, I can integrate this side. If I integrate this side, I get gamma 2. If I integrate this side, I'm just integrating the function gamma 1 that I found before. So I'll put that function in here and integrate it, multiply it by 2, uh, get a constant of integration at the end, which is going to be b. I can't use the same letter because these constants of integration might be independent. And I get the gamma 2 of t is this quadratic. And then z is 3y. So again, gamma 3 prime is going to be 3 times gamma 2. And I know what gamma 2 is. So I can now just integrate gamma 2 to get gamma 3 multiplied by 3. Integral of this multiplied by 3, adding again a new constant of integration. I have three unknowns, a, b, and c. They're going to depend on the starting point. And this is going to give me uh, this x component, this y component, this z component, a parametric curve, which is an integral curve of this for any choice of the constants a, b, and c. And that's about as much as we're going to do for actually solving integral curves. I'm more concerned that you can understand what they are and recognize them using the equation than to actually solve them. Solving integral curves would be the subject of a much deeper dive in some kind of differential equations course.